joining us today. Um, this is our first webinar of the e-commerce series we're running. It's called e-commerce behind the tech scene. Uh, while e-commerce is the overarching theme of uh, the series, um, the topic today is very much focused on security and mobile security specifically. Moving on to some short introductions. Uh, my name is Albena, um, Albena Krasteva. I am head of tech relations and growth at Zartis, and I will be the moderator for this talk. Um, and our speaker is Irene Brime, uh, MD at Shield. Thank you, Irene, for joining us. Thank you. So to give um, a short background on uh, Zartis uh, as an organizer, um, at Zartis we are a software services company with 100 plus engineers distributed across Europe. We help companies improve the way they build um, software and also get applications built in a faster, better way through providing nearshore staff augmentation and consulting services. As a company, we have extensive expertise in building e-commerce technology. And the purpose of this series of webinars is to learn from the community um, and the insights shared by our speakers and uh, attendees. Uh, happy, very happy to present our speaker today, Irene Brime. Um, Irene has worked in the security space for over 10 years as co-founder and MD for Europe at Shield. Um, SHIELD uses cutting-edge artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques to provide a robust suite of products across fraud prevention, network security, um, and identity intelligence. Their solution is used across e-commerce platforms, but also e-wallets, ride-hailing services, etc., etc., to protect them against digital threats. Um, and their impressive user network covers 7 billion devices and 500 million user accounts across the globe. I have known uh, Irene personally for several years now, uh, and I know that anything and everything she will share with us today will be both interesting and very useful. So looking forward, and I will now pass on the floor to Irene. Thank you. Thanks, Albena, and thanks, Zartes, for the kind introduction and for inviting us here today. And also thanks to everyone joining us today. I will try to make the webinar as short and insightful as possible. And as Albena said, please feel free uh, to reach out at the end for any questions um, at the end of uh, the webinar. So there's a new war being waged, and the battleground is your smartphone. See, the fraud landscape has changed tremendously in the last year. Fraud used to be all about migrating uh, physical credit cards into the digital space. There's clearly a second wave of fraud that is targeting mobile applications, mobile apps. So why, do fraudsters, why have fraudsters shifted to mobile apps? Well, uh, there are two main factors. The first one is that there is a perception that mobile apps are more secure. And a lot of companies are a bit unaware of the tools used by the fraudsters to defraud their systems, their mobile systems. And the second factor is that our lives are increasingly digital and convenience is key. So therefore the trend is to use apps that offer within one single touch, one single app, several, um, several services. So an example we all know will be Uber. Uber started as a ride hailing app. Uh, but now with just one app, one Uber, uh, with our account, we can, besides ride hailing, we can also order um, delivery food and uh, we can also use um, e-bikes. So another example, Albena, we both live in Berlin and we are both very familiar with an app made available by the Berlin Public Transport Authority, which is called Yelby. So Yelby allows its users, yeah, right? <laughs> Yelby allows its users to uh, book tickets uh, for all public transports in uh, here in Berlin, but it has also partnered with third-party providers that provide micro-mobility services such as e-scooters, bikes, uh, shared taxis. So this is fantastic. These are called super apps and they are fantastic news for everyone. They are fantastic news for companies like uh, the companies joining us in the audience today because it gives them the, the chance to um, engage more with their users in a way that their consumers use your app on a very regular basis or on a daily basis. For us consumers, it's also fantastic news because, I mean, we all love convenience in our very busy uh, daily lives. 
Unfortunately, for fraudsters, it's also good news because they can um, access, they can defraud uh, easily more options. And uh, with just one single hit, they will get double the, the gain. And uh, the losses in, um, in mobile apps can be huge. 7-Eleven in Japan, for example, lost half a million dollars within a month of launching their app. Well, app is a way for you to engage with your user, but it's also a point where fraud can happen. So example, fraud can happen at the point of registration with the registration of fake accounts. It can happen at the point of login when accounts are um, or accessing the loyalty card, redeeming, redeeming codes or redeeming, redeeming the reward points. They are basically only, fraudsters are only limited by the amount of services that, um, that you offer. Therefore, it is essential for, for you and for your team to look at the app of your awesome ecosystem and ask yourself, first and foremost, where your fraud happens. Let's say that you are an e-commerce app operated in Germany and most of your customers prefer invoice as a payment method. Well, chances are most of your fraud will not happen here, but that doesn't mean that you won't have any fraud here at registration or at login. So it is important to you know, sit down, have a, have a look um, and analyze what um, your biggest loopholes are and uh, where is the leak in the revenue. Let's now move to the, continue with the second part, the common malicious fraud tools. These are some of the commonly used tools by fraudsters to conduct attacks. Um, and I am pretty sure that most of you are familiar with, uh, with most of these tools. Now, the problems with these malicious tools is that they are widely available. Nowadays, we only need to go to Google, um, look for a particular tool, download it, install it, and there we go. So in a way, all these tools have made it very cheap and uh, very common. They have uh, bring democracy in a way to fraud attacks uh, because it's basically widely available to, to everyone. So this means that mobile apps offer um, more ways for fraudsters to defraud, more services for fraudsters to defraud, more entry points for fraudsters to get into your system. And these tools enable fraudsters to get into your system uh, very easily and fast. So let's take uh, group them in four different groups. Let's take a look at the first one, clone apps. Clone apps basically um, um, are used to host uh, multiple instances of the same app in one single device. So fraudsters use clone apps to make the attacks way cheaper uh, because basically they only, only need one device to, uh, to launch an attack against your ecosystem. Uh, VPNs um, add an additional layer behind which fraudsters can, uh, can hide and avoid detection of um, their actual IP address. Uh, GPS spoofers are also quite normal and they allow fraudsters to, um, to change the geolocation of uh, their true geolocation in a very arbitrary way. Uh, we've seen GPS spoofers uh, being used a lot in the ride-hailing right right -hailing platforms. So for example, drivers of this platform, let's say an Uber driver, uh, will use a GPS spoofer to plant his location in a very lucrative area, for example, uh, a car park uh, of an airport when, when he really is uh, far away or miles away. Um, emulators are um, other group of apps and what emulators do is they simulate mobile uh, device environments on desktop computers. So a fraudster might be using a uh, desktop but he's actually, uh, he actually has an emulator installed and he can use all these clone apps VPN and GPS spoofers from the emulator. So it's, uh, very automated, very fast, and uh, unfortunately, really common. I have a question, and this comes from me not being expert in security, but mm -hmm. I actually thought VPN is kind of, in my point of view, it was a security measure almost, and you're saying it is a malicious tool. Uh, that's a good question. I mean, obviously, they are, it's all how you use it, right? I mean, you can use it. Um, they are very... There are use cases where it's uh, legitimate use cases to use this, um, uh, these tools. So you can use, I think I have a clone app installed in my, in my mobile phone and I'm not using it for any fraudulent purposes. VPNs are also uh, very common. There are certain industries that are, uh, let's say, more accommodating to the use of these apps. So emulators are fairly common in, uh, within gamers. So the gaming industry will be perfectly fine with having an emulator. Um, and then VPNs are very normal, either as a way of security or also 
um, you know, if you live in a country where um, certain internet content is restricted or banned, then you might use a VPN. So, of course, um, having these tools installed in your mobile phone doesn't mean, doesn't automatically tag you as a fraudster. So there are legitimate uses for this. But again, it is the combination and how fraudsters use it of all these tools uh, to, commit, to commit fraud. So it is important for, uh, for the teams in the audience to basically be familiar with all these tools, keep a record in them, and uh, develop ways to know uh, whether the devices that are interacting with your mobile ecosystems are, are using these tools and in which, uh, which way. So coming back again, <laughs> yeah, I, ho I hope that answers your question. So please don't use your VPN you know, to do bad things. <laughs> I'll do my best. Okay, um, so you remember from what I was saying at the beginning, um, I mentioned that the first part will be mostly about explaining uh, mobile ecosystems, second part will be more about uh, malicious tools, um, and I'd like to now share with you some uh, some cases, some common cases that we have detected and that fraudsters um, use and how fraudsters use these tools. Um, so the first time, first case will be one that we are all very familiar with, account takeover. Um, in this case, well, Froster will use a combination of the tools combined with um, some other uh, password tracking tools to conduct a brute force attempt or to steal the credentials of, you know, username and password from uh, legitimate users in your app. And once, um, once those accounts are breached and once they have access to those accounts, they can basically do whatever um, uh, whatever services you offer to your um, to your users whether it is uh, using the credit card or accessing the credit card or the debit card that is associated to that account, or using the, if you offer a digital wallet, they can access the credit, they can make an unauthorized transaction, they can make an unauthorized purchase of uh, goods or services that you offer in your, um, in your service. The second case is also a case of account takeover, but it's, it's slightly more sophisticated. Um, this happened at a very large scale uh, by which, you know, fraudsters, again, they log in uh, to the user account, they access the password and the username, and they realize that they need an OTP. So what we've seen that they've done is they have called the user and pretend to be the customer service. So the user um, reveals the, uh, the one-time password that the user receives to uh, his associated mobile phone and uh, the account is compromised. And then after that, the account can be either sold in the illegal market or you know, can be used to acquire whatever good services that you make available for your users in the app. Um, again, this is slightly more sophisticated and obviously there's, um, uh, there's a way for this, which is, um, I'd like to emphasize also that this requires a little bit of effort from all the fraud um, community when it comes to educating users to not to reveal certain information to anybody calling um, calling them. But I mean, this has happened and this has been, this happens. Um, another, um, another case where these tools are used are something that is extremely common also, the fake account uh, registration. Um, I think we've, uh, we are all familiar with this, processors use bots and they use the bots to combine them with the malicious tools, whether they are VPNs, CPS buffers, or emulators to simulate unique devices. Uh, so these unique devices will create fake accounts and all of these fake accounts will look like um, that they come from different devices. And uh, once they are um, authorized and approved, basically can be used to complete fake purchases, um, promo abuse, incentive abuse, and um, any kind of services um, allowed within the, within the app. So again, what is um, essential here in a way, and I will get into this after all the scenarios, is to, for your team, whether your team develops it in-house or whether your team um, decides to uh, resource, outsource it, or to a third party partially or completely is um, to have and to use device information in order to um, stop, the, stop the attack. The, um, 
the next um, scenario will be um, something that I am sure uh, most of us have been very tempted to do, which is the referral abuse programs. Um, I remember not so many weeks ago, there was a, a quite a popular uh, platform here in Berlin that launched a new service and they were offering um, referral promos. So whether you refer it to a friend and you would have, I think it was anything between three to five euro um, on your next service. So what fraudsters do is basically, again, they use the same malicious tools or a combination of all the malicious tools to simulate unique devices create fake accounts and redeem all those offers and all those codes. The reason why I wanted to showcase this uh, particular uh, scenario, this particular case, is because very often, whenever I talk about fraud, a lot of people um, associate it automatically with just uh, payment fraud. And um, they don't realize that actually promo fraud, you know, whether it's through the refer a friend or any other kind of promo or rewards, also cause financial loss to companies. So it's important that we see that, you know, in mobile ecosystems, is it goes beyond the pure and traditional payment fraud. And it also goes to all the kinds of fraud which are um, equally bad from the financial perspective for companies. Another case, same promo will be the first purchase. Um, we all, we have all got this, uh, and Albena, I'm sure that you, um, You've also been giving all these flyers uh, when you are um, in the UBAN and there's um, a new, you know, um, delivery app and they uh, give you many. Uh, many of them, yeah, or they are even in Berlin, they sometimes stamp it on the floor. So um, again, what fraudsters do is to use the same amount, same combination, um, simulate devices, create fake accounts and receive the incentive from the first purchase. Um, again, another like to emphasize that it's not only about payments fraud, it's also about um, all the financial losses that, that merchants can, um, that merchants face. And the last scenario would be a very common one. Uh, the one that we are all familiar with would be the fraud and payment by credit card. Um, the fraudster creates the fake account, uses, associates to that fake account uh, credit card. Um, fraudsters usually obtain these credit cards coming from the legal market or after a data breach, and they basically conduct a complete purchase at merchants. So merchants, what they find, or the, you know, the, the owner uh, of the mobile app, what they find is a chargeback. Um, some of you might say that it is possible to uh, for banks now to uh, trigger an OTP, but again. As I mentioned before, it is also possible to get the OTP and trick the real, the legitimate credit card owner to reveal the OTP and authorize the payment and finish the, the payment. So what all these scenarios have, um, have in common and what, what companies can do um, to increase the line of defense, uh, what I find is that first, first of all, they are using tools, a um, wide array of tools, to create unique devices that are manipulated and to mimic the behavior of, of real users. So it is important for, for the teams. And again, whether you do it in-house or whether you outsource it partially or totally to create and to implement systems that first can capture um, something quite basic that I think every single um, mobile app will have, which is the fingerprint, capturing the fingerprint of the device. So from the brand to the operating system uh, to more sophisticated features like uh, whether the device has been manipulated or whether there are any malicious tools. And then obviously be able to analyze the, the user behavior. So how does the finger swipe? Um, how is the user moving within your app? Um, is the user typing his username and password or is he copying and pasting it? So these kind of things that actually might be might seem small traits, but when added, it can give you a good idea of um, the nature of the user. Is the user um, a human, or is it does it look more like a like a bot? So it is important to um, try to have as much information, capture as much information from the device, and combine that information from the device itself, so uh, the hardware, as well as from the passive behavior of, of the user um, 
get all that data standardized in a way and create, um, you know, a sort of device that uh, allows you and gives you on what is going on on your ecosystem. Um, so once you have all the data, once you have all the visibility, you are able to see which are the connecting points between all the devices. And it allows you to have more information, take better decisions, and, um, and decide what to do, whether you want to block it or how you want to, what you want to do with that uh, device information that, that you get. Um, just to finish, I promise it'll be short. <laughs> so just to finish, uh, if you had to, or if I had to, you know, give some key takeaways will be, um, first of all, understand that uh, mobile apps are ecosystems. Understand what your different checkpoints, what your points of interactions with your users are, where your fraud happens. The second will be know the malicious tools, make sure that your team is familiar with them, keeps a record. Um, so that's it. I hope you find it useful. Um, I'll be happy to take any questions. Albena. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Irene. I personally found it very, very interesting uh, and you made some very interesting points and use cases that uh, I hadn't considered. Um, so uh, thank you for that. I guess kind of one question I have to start with is what is the follow-up follow -up action? So does that mean a kind of I should block all devices or users that are using malicious tools or? Mm. That's a very good question. And um, it depends so much. I mean, when uh, when we talk to companies, every company is different and there's not gonna be one size fits all. So there might be companies that the industry they belong to is maybe more accommodating to certain tools. So they find it quite okay that have um, um, to have users um, with a VPN or with an emulator. Um, it also depends on the company itself, um, what they want to do, what they want to achieve. So might be instances, for example, let's say that a company is just open, uh, has opened a new, a new market, right? So it's a new company. Um, let's say that um, there's a new app, uh, right hailing or e-commerce app opening up in, in Berlin, in Germany. Obviously they want to um, get more users, they want to get critical user base. Um, in that case, sometimes companies tend to be a, a little bit more um, flexible with, uh, with the tools. So it's completely and entirely up to them. So this is something that really um, teams need to, you know, sit down and it actually involve uh, and, and involve many other teams not only engineering, but also, you know, marketing and, uh, and payments and, and fraud and see what they want to achieve, the tools that they have, and then decide whether, you know, with, what's the level of risk that they are comfortable with and uh, ultimately what they want to do. It's very personal and I guess there's no correct answer for, for this because it's, it's basically entire up to the company. Very good. Um, I see we have first questions coming in from the audience. Just a quick reminder for everyone attending. Uh, there are two ways to ask a question. So you can uh, type in your question through the Q&A option, um, or you can also raise your hand and uh, we'll give you the floor to speak. Um, so first uh, question from the audience, Michal is asking, hi Rene, um, interesting presentation. Um, I have a question on fraudulent attacks. Are they most likely to happen on the mobile app itself or the web API, um, which sits behind it? Um, I guess it will be on the mobile app itself. Um, so, so what it's, it basically gives fraudsters uh, a better way or an easier way to mimic and to make the lines of defense or to make whatever systems that uh, companies have um, easier and trick. So what they do is basically um, 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 uh, create all these devices and they change them, change them uh, very fast and then mimic the user behavior. So I think it overpass, um, let's say, defense systems that might be um, a 
a little bit obsolete or that might not be completely up to date. Very good. Um, so I guess kind of you made the point um, around um, your 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 main product is around intelligence and having that overview of what is going on. Can you maybe share with us some examples of uh, clients using device intelligence, um, kind of in their risk management framework, and uh, uh, kind of what is the benefits and outcomes they're seeing? Um, I don't want this to sound like a sales pitch. So basically, um, only I mean, examples. No, no. The, I mean, the, the whole point is basically try um, um, make sure you know what is available out there in terms of make sure you know what processors are doing, what are they using, how are they using it, and and then based on that, just you know make make your team make your team work. So when it comes to how do um, Again, how do clients um, use the device intelligence? It's it's very different. It it depends completely on on the industry. So we do have, for example, I, I think I shared um, one of the scenarios about ride hailing apps, uh, the drivers using GPS spoofers, um, because you know they, they just basically plant their GPS to uh, to make it look like they are in a very lucrative area. So uh, the ride hailing platform will see that there's a lot of drivers in that area and they'll be automatically on a search in the price um, when they are not there. So this is a way, you know, for right hailing platforms, if they are able to, if their teams are able to see that the devices accessing the ecosystem are using GPS buffers, um, well, basically they can take action on, on that. How do they choose to do that is completely and entirely up to, you know, up to them. Every company is different. Um, so, so yeah, I guess that would be one, um, 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 an example VPNs. I mean, if for e-commerce websites, for example, it might be more about, you know, all the fake account registrations, how are they using, um, all the combination of tools. So not particularly one combination, one tool specifically, but the combination of tools used to create fake accounts. So they seem that they are coming from, uh, from everywhere. And then, you know, you are able to block them. Um, before they finalize or they complete the, the purchase on your e-commerce uh, app. Very good. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit and please feel free not to answer that if you choose not to. But if there is one example of uh, something you've seen like a really outrageous or a kind of clever attack, um, you don't have to mention company names or anything, but can you share any details with us? Uh, we've seen everything. We've seen a lot of things and some people get very, very sophisticated. Um, um, I mean, I, I, I don't know, I guess I, um, one of the, the ones that um, it really got my mind, um, it didn't happen in Europe, uh, but then well, basically they were using a lot of um, not only online, but they were, uh, there was a, a big factor of social engineering um, involved. Um, so by which not only, well, they were basically, um, the fraudsters knew the people or the owners of the um, of the brick and mortar shops where all these uh, loyalty points and all these coupons could be redeemed. And, um, and yeah, that was, uh, that was one that I thought, well, you know, that's the perfect combination of the digital and, uh, and online. Um, another one that was kind of the funny way uh, uh, was a, a wallet, an e-wallet. Um, during from Monday to Friday at lunchtime, um, there was a, a spike of transfers from uh, different devices to one single device. And obviously, um, you know, the company seeing all this um, basically thought that it would be a very typical case of money laundering or very typical case of someone trying to uh, send a lot of money to one single account. So maybe the froster owns all those accounts and he's basically transferring all the funds to one single account. And from that single account, he will cash out. Um, it turns out that that account that was getting all the funds was the account of, the, of an intern of a very, um, very well-known company. And basically the intern tasks included 
going to buy lunch for everyone in his team, <laughs> which explains all the transfers that were, yeah. So, I mean, this is uh, a little bit, you know, um, kind of funny or anecdotes, but, uh, but yeah, I think we've, we've seen everything. Well, yeah. Not every red flag is, um, mm -hmm. is, is, is worrying. Yeah, 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 exactly. Everyone should be investigated, but not everything. <laughs> Luckily, not everything. <laughs> Massive losses. Yeah. Very good. Um, great. Let me see. I think the audience is a little bit quiet at the moment. So I have kind of more um, general questions. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, this uh, we're organizing the, um, the webinar. As, as a series, part of um, an e-commerce um, series of webinars. So um, kind of, I suppose uh, e-commerce is one of the areas you touch on through, um, through your work, but I would be um, kind of curious in your point of view on what are the trends um, you're seeing happen in e-commerce? What are, what is already happening? What is, uh, how has the landscape already changed? And on the other side of that, how do you foresee uh, 2021? Um, so, yeah, that's really interesting. I guess what we, what I see is what everybody sees, right? Like COVID-19 basically was, um, uh, I mean, it, it changed all our habits and um, it has, it has put e-commerce right, right in the spotlight. So I guess what I, uh, if I have to take out my crystal ball and think uh, what 2021 will bring is um, yeah, more reinforced e-commerce uh, for everyone and all players. I mean, it has forced companies that maybe were not paying enough attention to their digital side, particularly to their mobile app, because depending on the region, some people will still tend to go more onto the desktop. Um, it has basically forced them to invest more and um, and it's going to be, I think, it, if anything, it's, it has accelerated digitalization. So that's from the, um, on the e-commerce side, consumer side, I guess, more demand uh, of, you know, wider services, faster services. And uh, when it comes to anything like payments or technological, I think we are already seeing it. Even in very, very cash-oriented Berlin and Germany, we are seeing an increase uh, in the number of cashless payments. So that's another thing I think that's another aspect that I think Europe will be changing in the following months. Uh, I can only hope that Berlin further changes <laughs> from cash to, <laughs> to cashless payments. Getting um, there, it's getting there. <laughs> I hope so. Um, one uh, follow-up question, you mentioned some markets uh, in some areas are more using desktop versus mobile. Could you give us a rough idea, like who um, who are the ones who are very much mobile and who are the ones a little bit still using? I think in general, Asia is, I mean, has a very high penetration, penetration of mobile of a smartphone, a uh, very highly educated um, consumer, very tech savvy consumer. Um, so definitely it's all, it's, I mean, the, the, the percentage changes if you compare it to Europe. Uh, Europe. Europe depends also on the company and on the industry, but it tends to be more, uh, more equal. Um, but certainly in the last years, we've seen um, an increase towards the mobile side. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, the last question from my end. Um, so within a kind of uh, your area of expertise, and you can choose that as e-commerce or rather security, I suppose, um, what is one piece of content you would recommend checking out? So this could be a podcast, a book, um, an article or a study that you found really impactful. Mm, okay. So for, for, Safety for security. I like this podcast, which is uh, by a gentleman called Brett Johnson. And the podcast name is called The Angler, Anglerfish. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, so the interesting thing about it is that this gentleman, um, he used to be, or he's a former USA most wanted cyber criminal. Wow. And he's now a consultant for cybersecurity. So he has set up this podcast, which is very interesting. And I, I really like his, I mean, the content, but also his style, how he, um, how he relates things. The kind of, um, he's a keynote speech, a speaker. So he also has access to, you know, very interesting people that he always invites to his uh, podcasts. So that's, uh, that's a podcast I would, I would recommend. Yeah. 
Awesome. I will definitely check it out. Um, thank <laughs> thanks for joining. No problem. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, I think we can uh, probably wrap it up here. Uh, so thank you so much, Irene. It was a really, thank really fascinated, uh, fascinating presentation. And I think we all learned a lot. Um, thank you uh, to everyone for, um, for attending. Um, just a quick reminder, we have new um, and more webinars coming up. Uh, so please check out the, um, the overall um, page. We have a webinar on logistics. Uh, coming up on September 15th, 20. We have a webinar on logistics coming up in late September <laughs> and, uh, and one more on kind of building scalable e-commerce um, in on September 30th. Uh, so please uh, check those out and join us again. Thanks again. Thank you Irene, so much. Thank you hope, so much. <laughs> hope you have a good um, rest of the day.